Dues to Dads is a podcast to help men understand and navigate the transition of being a single dude into a family man. How do we make sense of it all? Well, we probably won't be able to, but let's go ahead and have some fun trying. And we are back. We're back. This is the Dudes to Dads podcast. I am Jason Kreidman. I'm Alan Bush. And thank you for joining us once again. Today we are going to be talking about a very serious topic. Not yeah. that we don't talk about serious things here <laughs> yeah, on Dudes to Dads. constantly Dads. joke. All yeah, the time. all the time. All, you know, funny all the time. <laughs> Everything you've heard, don't listen to it. It's all So over. this episode is about death. Yeah. Uh, it's about bereavement, grief, you know, the various uh, things that... Uh, you deal with death. Yeah. Um, and, and really from the perspective of a parent, how do you communicate death and deal with death to, to children? Right. You know, right. that's something I personally have dealt with this. Mm -hmm. uh, it was something that I struggled with and had some great, you know, assistance and tips on how to do this. And I thought that this would be a great idea to bring in an actual expert once again. Sure. Yeah. Other than us just talking out of our intestinal tract, <laughs> we actually have somebody who knows what they're talking yeah, about. Yeah, that's great. So today we have... Mr. Jim Riser. Jim, can you say hello, just hello to the audience? Hello, everybody. Hey. So Jim is a marriage and family therapist. Mm -hmm. um, he also is the bereavement services coordinator at Hospice of the North Coast. Wow. So Jim, that's a fancy uh, sort of title for something that is very, very serious. How would you describe what you do? Well, hospice services are required by Medicare to provide bereavement to their patients' families. Okay. And so, but they don't really specify what bereavement is so much. So it could look very different from hospice to hospice. But in that, the hospice that I work at, Hospice of the North Coast, uh, we provide bereavement services not only to our patients' families, but to the community as well. And bereavement is defined, I mean, that was a fancy word that I wasn't familiar with when I sort of went through this. Mm -hmm. That's just the, so the whole process of dealing with death? Is that what you would consider it? That's a that's good description because okay. there like are... Grieving, uh, essentially. Right. And there's yeah. many times that uh, we are working with the patients while they're still alive and their families. Uh, we classify it as a pre-bereavement fancy term right got it got it but yeah this so you know that they're terminal you know that they're they have a certain amount of time left to go if you will I mean, well we know that their their physician has stated that in their best estimate they have six months or less to okay. live so it's actually a time stamp right it's, but yeah. i often tell patients or people thinking about hospice you have my permission not to die. So just because your physician may, it's not a know, life. It's not a that, sentence yeah. to die. It's yeah. not a you sentence don't have to, to die. Follow through with this. And oddly enough, though we're talking about death, and those of you that have stayed aboard on this conversation didn't get scared of the word. Um, it's not about death as much as it's about quality of living. Okay. Mm, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. No, that that's that's interesting. So I want to do you know, kind of understand, you know, how did you get into this field? I mean, you, you obviously were, you know, studying marriage and family. How did you specifically, f you know, pick the bereavement area or, you know, the grief area? Well, have you ever been walking down the street and kind of fell into a pothole? <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, really what happened to me here. I was uh, looking for a site to do my internship with and had met this woman that was uh, helping me by supervising me. Okay. And she just happened to be the executive director of Hospice of North Coast at the time. Wow. And from, our, from her supervising me, she uh, liked my work, and she'd asked, well, do you want to intern here? And I said, sure. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, I've been a, have a, had a very blessed life in that uh, really not lost anybody very close to me. Uh, I have my parents, I have my family still here and so forth. But uh, so I didn't know a lot about grief sure. or bereavement. I knew like the textbook. Right, right. So doing this work. You've uh, learned quite a bit, I'm sure. Learned quite a bit about it, yeah. Right. No, that's, that, that's good. And so I, I 
how I met Jim is quite interesting, actually, or at least I think is interesting, is I, I which I had mentioned, my mother passed away, Dr. Ellen, who we yeah. show clips of on exactly. the, our, you know, several um, episodes. She had passed away a couple of years ago, and my father had done some grief counseling mm. and went to a grief counselor and, and said, you know, this was up where he lived. And he said, I think it might be a good idea that you do this. And I was like, really? Why? Why? Like. You know, just confused and like, I don't know if I want to talk to somebody, but I thought, you know what, instead of like sort of a one on one thing, maybe I'll just go to like a group because that's what he had done. I said, you know what, I'll I'll try it. Mm. So I was looking around and I found Jim was leading at the time a all men's grief group. Which is even more strange. Yeah. You know, right. I mean, you're you're dealing with death. I'm talking I'm gonna be talking about personal stuff. Do I really want to sit in a room full of guys, you know, to do this? <laughs> that was my first thought. <laughs> right. So I go to the meeting and immediately I felt like I had, you know, found the right place. I I yeah. you know, Jim and the other there was another gentleman as well who was was sort of facilitating this. There was a couple I actually the, the first one I may have been the only one or another person there. And they were trying to get this thing going. And so I stuck with it. And I, I can't tell you how much it helped me going through that process. And I will say that it actually became the foundation and sort of the reasons of like how I got into doing what I'm doing now with the parenting stuff. Right. Because I said, you know what? I'm going through this grief. What is the area that I feel like I need? I want to help other people. And it was in the parenting area. And I remember I talked with Jim about it. I was like, you know, I'm thinking I might just start this group mm-hmm. to, you know, talk with other dads and do that. And, he, you know, he was very supportive and was like, go for it. And I'm like, <laughs> OK, you know. And that's so thank you. I mean, that's. Dudes so, to dads. Yeah. So dudes to dads. That's kind of how it was created. I mean, yeah. it's, he had a Weird. lot of very instrumental in, in yeah. sort of supporting and helping me think about that. Right. Because I think I was going through a transition of like, you know, when when somebody that means that much close, you kind of start questioning you know, what am I doing on this earth? You know, did I do, did I, am I doing everything I can to sort of be a good person and help people and, and, and help myself and all these things. And so that's how this all kind of came about. I was going through the parenting classes. I was doing all this stuff. I was doing the bereavement class. So, you know, together that sort of established these first few things of dudes to dads. I remember coming in and be like, Hey, I had my first meeting, mm-hmm. you know, and talking about it and doing that. And so, um, you know, I stuck with it. I occasionally then came back and helped, you know, sort of when you when you come back and sort of talk about I don't call it the other side, but you start talking in a group about like kind of how you got through it. Mm-hmm. You know, it really helps the other people in the group. Sure. And so, I, you know, I thought when I started doing this, I was like, you know, it'd be great to get Jim in here. You know, I mean, because, <laughs> you know, th- first of all, this is a topic that is not easy to talk about. Right. And, you know, it's something I think is really, really needed. And I learned so much by going through this that. You know, I, I just felt like it was really, really valuable. And so thank you. I mean, I just, you know, appreciate that. It's uh, it was something that um, I think had a really big impact in my life and sort of how how it's now gone, mm-hmm. you know, and sort of where I've where I've come from from there. Um, so I wanted to sort of, you know, touch on a little bit of the topics that we're you know sort of centered on here is about, you know, talking with kids about death. And so we have sort of a little bit of background. We understand sort of you know, what bereavement is about and, and the services that can be provided, where do you start? You know, and there's so many different types of death, if you will. Like I think we were talking before, you know, it could be the death of a sibling. It could be the death of a parent. It could be the death of an animal, you know, a pet. Um, you know, you had mentioned even divorce, you know, divorce right. is can, can death be of the, a family. Yeah. The death of the family. I mean, th- there's it's so many time. different facets of it. It's like, where do we start? You know, where is the place to start with this? That is a good question. <laughs> so well, let's start with in what I typically encounter. Uh, so typically I'm encountering the death of a, of a family member mm-hmm. when I'm meeting with kids. And, you know, usually it's someone close, like a parent. So the kids... A lot of the times, there's so much going on before the death. Of course, when, when I'm seeing them through our hospice services, we're talking about somebody that's been sick. Right, yeah. And they're probably fairly young if they have minor children. Yeah. Or so, it's a grandparent. I guess it could be a grandparent. It could be a grandparent. Yeah. I guess uh, I'm thinking of, of more of the family ones that I've, I've right. dealt with recently. So I'll just start there. Sure. Because probably the most heartfelt 
most impact is the direct thing. connection where you're like the the mom of them is in yeah. their thirties, forties, has cancer right. or something, whatever, and then you right. know, passes away. Yeah. And so I just want you to think for a moment what that might be like for a child. Maybe think of your child, whatever age that they are, and what's going to be happening in their world. Let's say while that parent is sick. So maybe they have a disease you've heard about as a child called cancer. Yeah. Something you can identify with closely with death and dying. And of course, when you have a cancer diagnosis, the first thing the family wants the patient to do is to fight. Right. So now you come on hospice. What does that mean? You know, so a young child, they come on hospice, they may have no idea what that means. It's just another place... Right. You know, in fact, most of the time our patients are at home. So, you know, just got these people coming in, taking care of mom or dad. So they don't maybe really know what it means, but they, children will sense something's different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? And I guess and we have to sort of say, you know, that the, the age of the child is going to have a huge impact, obviously. Yeah. You know? When the child is maybe in a toddler state, they, they, they feel something. They know if they're a little bit older, they kind of they've heard what's going on. They know somebody's sick. I mean, I can only talk from my own personal experience. You know, my son was three years old, I believe, around three. And my daughter was one. Right. You know, they kind my three year old knew that something was up. But really didn't understand it, you know, and didn't know, understand the impact. And that's why this was so, this topic was so, you know, near and dear to me is sure. kind of understanding how do I talk to them about this? You know, they're, they're three years old. You try to put yourself in there. There's all these things. We're going to go here. We're going to do this. This person's sick. We're driving. We're driving hours every weekend, you know, to see my mom. Why do we keep going up there? You know, and, and why can't she walk around? Why can't she go on the playground with me? You know, or whatever. These are, you're right. It's like, you, you, it's hard to look from the child's perspective. Because well, you know, you're just dealing with your own stuff. Exactly. <laughs> and, in, and in your case, where the, the dying patient is, is a bit removed from the immediate family, mm -hmm. right? It's the grandmom. And in your personal situation, your mom didn't live close by. Yeah, you know? it was an hour away or something right. like that. Yeah. So it, it would still be different, but what are the kids going to be really looking at? Who are they looking to? Right. Me. You. Yeah. And what's different about dad? Why is dad kind of different? We're going to go up Sad, here. angry. Yeah, sad yeah. and angry. Or, or, you know, what was your reaction at that time? You're trying to hold it together? Yeah, I, you know, I had a combination of emotion. I, I got angry a lot because I, I think I was mad at the world that somebody was being taken away. You know, mm -hmm. so that was one emotion that happened. Of course, just sadness, you know, just pure sadness and crying. And I, and I, yeah, but at the same time, I do recall trying to hide my emotion from my children, thinking I need to be strong during this period. Like that, for whatever reason, that's what the man I thought, you know, I need to be strong during this. And strong meant I can't cry and I can't show my emotion. Now, that's, I think back, it's like that's a little weird because I was always given permission to have emotion. You know, it's not like in my family we suppressed our emotions or anything like that. But I was thinking of it about from my kid's standpoint that I didn't want them to see the pain because mm -hmm. you, you think, well, I don't want my kid to go through that pain also. So I was, in a sense, hiding that. You know, I, I remember I would cry when I'm in the shower because it was a place where nobody yeah. could see me. And his you know? water dripping. <laughs> yeah, like, hey, no, nobody's going to... No, I just had hot water in my eyes. Like, don't worry about it. It's shampoo, you know? It's shampoo in my eyes. Um, but, you know, my kids didn't then see that. And it wasn't until I went to the grief counseling where, you know, I was... I, the concept of giving yourself permission to grieve was honed in and really, you know, back, you know over and over and over again where I just let it out. And I was saying, and when so when my kids would ask or something, I would explain it and just say, "No, I'm really sad, you know. And grandma's gone, mm. you know, and that makes me upset, you know, it makes me sad." And so I was honest, and I was, you know, I started to get that understanding of how to deal with it. Yeah. At least, you know, I say there's all different ways to deal with it, and everyone deals with it. But the idea of being open and honest, I think, also helped me in that process yeah. because I, you know, the feelings have to come out. You know, they have to come out. Mm -hmm. And so, and I recall many, many nights where Jim and the other gentleman, 
I'd walk in and they'd throw tissues on the on the on the um, center console and be like, "You better be ready for tonight." You know, it was like this game that they wanted to make sure they're getting the emotion out of me. And we're gonna we, make you cry. Yeah, I mean, we had a good rapport like that where we could joke about it because. Yeah. You know, it wasn't as serious, if you will, in that aspect. But there was, I mean, I would come through there crying and gnawing. I mean, it, my gut would hurt mm-hmm. with, with the amount of motion coming out. And it was allowing myself to do that. And it, what, you fa- what you found is, or at least I found, is as I got more and more of the emotion out, it star- started to hurt a little less. That was the only way I could explain it. It was yeah. like... It still hurts. You know, I mean, no matter what. And there's still even be days where I'll get, you know, I get really sad. I may even tear up or whatever when I talk about it. But the pain is less. The experience of like think I remember even you making me go through the process of what it was like while she was dying. Mm. You know, or right then. I was like, are you really going to make me do, you know, I was upset. <laughs> and but what happened was it forced me to see that and it it became less scary. Yeah. You know, you're going through that process and going, oh, yeah, I do remember. This is what she looked like. This is what she sounded like. This is what. And it's like, why do I want to relive that? Mm. You know, um, what's interesting now is that we're playing all these tapes and we're playing all these things. And so every time I hear my mom's voice, there's a little bit of sadness, but it's also like it feels good. Mm. You know, it's like a, there's a good memory that comes Especially up. Especially when she's talking about something that you did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Jason did this. Yeah. yeah. My son was kind of weird like this. Right. No, and, and, and so I think that, you know, that the grieving helped for me to be honest about it. And I think that maybe that's a tip. You know, if we were going to sort of consolidate some tips, it was just being honest, you know, and me owning those feelings and, and just, you know, allowing my children to see me cry. Mm-hmm. You know, it's okay. It was okay to cry. Like, you gave me permission to do that, you know? Is that maybe a major thing that, you know, that happens? Definitely. Well, let me just elaborate a little more. I mean, you did a great job yeah. there. You really did. <laughs> so there's an opportunity in grief that people don't necessarily see. And the opportunity, well, I guess you're a living example, mm-hmm. Jason, in that uh, look what you've done. You know, starting dues to dads. I remember yeah. in in the group when you were searching for, you know, what's next? What do I want to do? Right. And that's what grief does. Grief gives us an opportunity because it splits us so wide open. And you expressed just a minute ago about how you just can't contain the emotions. Right. And and that's why you're split open. But in that, you have a opportunity right then and there to be real honest with yourself. And as you're gaining that honesty and that truth and seeing yourself maybe in ways you never saw yourself before, it also then allows you to move into becoming the man you wanted to be. Right. And figuring out what that would be. And that's the gift of grief. That's the gift your mom left you. Sure. You know? So in relationship to children, you know, as a father, you know, what did you want to teach your children? I mean, that's always forefront in our minds, isn't it? Right. You know, what do we want them to gain? What do we want them to learn? And so I think really the first tip is be honest. Yeah. You said you were honest with them. Yeah. That's a good And that was a big change. I mean, that was a big change just to be honest and say, hey, it's okay. You know, it's okay if I, if I want to cry, if I want to, you know, and even my wife too, you know, to like, I have to be this strong man to, that doesn't cry. I mean, it's like, no, I, I, if I feel something, just go ahead and feel it. Yeah. Give yourself that permission to feel. I remember that over and over and over again. Yeah. Well, too, I remember that with you and we talked about the relationship, remember, mm-hmm. with your wife. And, and I think that changed for you. Yeah. As well, that you allowed her in a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, my wife was really supportive and helpful, not only to me, but to my mother during that day. And she's a, my, my wife's a nurse. So right. she was very instrumental in sort of helping, you know, I mean, there were some times where there were some things that needed to be done. And my wife just stepped in and did it. Right. You know, I wasn't able to do it <laughs> or didn't right. want to do it, you know, um, and, and th- that, yeah, that brought us closer together, definitely, because I saw a, a 
you know, a different side or a uh, different side, but it was sort of more exaggerated, you know, of some of the things that I was like, wow, that's, that was pretty incredible you yeah. know, that she did that, you know? And, uh, so, so maybe just a more of an appreciation, you know? Um, and so I was, you know, I just, I think that was, you're right. That's the word is just honest and just being sort of open and honest and just going like, Hey, this is how I feel, you know? And I remember sort of a little bit of a weight lifted, you know, with the ideas like, Oh, I can actually cry if I want to, mm-hmm. you know, that's cool. It's like, it's okay. You know, I don't have to hide something, you know? Yeah. Um, well, we'll, let's talk about the other side of that. Cause that's probably what happens most often. And that is not talking about it. Sweep it under the rug. <laughs> well, you know, I don't want to traumatize my children. I don't want to upset them. But what is worse, knowing or guessing? Yeah. Right. So I remember, I think your son was maybe four. My son was like three or four, yeah. Yeah. So even at four years old, they're going to sense quite a bit. Even oh, at yeah. one year old, I think we sense quite a bit. Sure. Right. So, but if he doesn't really know what's going on and no one's really talking to him, he's going to, you know, assume make, something, make stuff <laughs> up. Make stuff up, yeah. yeah you know? that, yeah. And, and it could be pretty profound or it could be pretty damaging. So, let's say a father gets distant because uh, they lost their mother. Right. And he starts withdrawing. And before that, he was pretty engaged with his son and so forth. And now there's this difference. What's a four-year-old going to think? It's him. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. There's, I did something wrong. Yeah. There's something wrong with me. Dad doesn't love me anymore. Wow. Yeah, it could be pretty That's pro- crazy. Pretty profound. <laughs> yeah. You don't think about that. No, but they, yeah, I can totally see them jumping to that conclusion. Right. You know, because in their head, they're like, well, what's going on? Okay, well, I must be causing this because their world's very, you know, they're egocentric, you know, yeah. the kids are. And so they think that they're. The well, I, and I there. recall, I mean, this is just a little bit. I recall that protect that protection that a parent wants to do to their kid, you know, because that's the gut. Your gut is to protect um, even when there is sickness or ailments and they don't disclose it. You know, as a parent, we don't disclose it. Like I remember, you know, the hesitation of my mom saying that something was as severe as it was. You know, hey, we got some tests back. Well, no, it'll be fine. You know, like she even had that protective mechanism for a while and, you know, until you just couldn't protect it anymore to finally just be like, no, here's the reality, you Mm -hmm. know. But I do recall, you know, even myself feeling like that, like, well, should I tell them about this? You know, like, because I want to protect them. I don't want, why do they have to know? And that's how a lot of people are. It's like, why do they, why should they know? It's just going to make it worse, Mm -hmm. you know, or does it? You know? right. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. <laughs> I, I was, I'm hesitating because I'm you know, thinking of uh, I had this situation happen to me in just in a conversation because my mother told me that, yeah, I totally understand. Well, you know, I might not want to tell anybody I was dying. Right. Not even you. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> and the reason, you know, I come from that standpoint, I can understand that the parent would want to protect and not want to upset the kids or their life and so forth. But you can do so much at the end of life. It doesn't have to be scary. Yeah. It, it can be a pretty beautiful thing. And, you know, people ask me all the time, well, oh, that hospice work, that must be really tough. But it is just such an honor. It's such an honor to be with the family and be with the patient and and know you're supporting them through this. Right. And and then when a family really pulls together at end of life, you know, it's quite a beautiful thing. Yeah, and I would imagine you see different families acting differently. You know, there's some that are going to celebrate, yeah, totally. party. You know, they party <laughs> different nationalities too. Yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. they celebrate death or be drinking or doing something, while other ones are just completely silent and don't you know talk about anything. Um, well, again, it's going to bring out all the highs stuff. and lows. It's going to bring yeah. out all the stuff. Yeah, and so families that. You know, have a lot of issues. They're going to, and you know, everything gets into a place of homeostasis, right? Right. So even with lots of issues, because the way the family dynamic and structure is, everything's 
under control. What happens when you take a piece out? Right. It's all different. Chaos. And it starts to blow apart and yeah. chaos. But, you know. So you man, you help to try to manage that chaos. Exactly. This is also an opportunity to resolve a lot of this stuff. Yeah. An opportunity to get closer. An opportunity to share deeper. Right. And make you think. I mean, that's the part. It makes you think about like, wow, I could have done this, should have done this. Maybe I need to treat people differently. Maybe I need to do something yeah. differently. Yeah, often you the know? loss of somebody will will kind of make you th- rethink your own life. Right. And then you kind of... Yeah, that's absolutely what happened yeah. for me. Yeah. You know, kind of looking at it, it's like, oh, what am I doing? Yeah. You know, I look at my mom's life work and how much effort was put into this to helping people. And I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. You know, am I doing anything this, you know, <laughs> I'm making people money, you know, and people <laughs> like that. Yeah. I mean, people like that, yeah. but... Money's good. You know, it, but that's not making me happy. You know, the work and the serving here and doing this stuff, 100 times happier yeah. than closing a deal. Although some of the deals are pretty good. <laughs> but it is it is something where that feeling, you know, somebody will come up to me and just be like, hey, thanks. You know, thing, I heard this. I heard the podcast. And, you know, that was great when you were talking. I mean, that's such a good thing. And so you probably get that a lot as well. I mean, when you're helping the family and they just thank you. You're not doing it for praise, but it's just that feeling of like, wow, that that had an impact on somebody. Absolutely. You know, that's I mean, that's that's why people get into counseling and therapy and, you know, that kind of thing. It's almost we, speaking we get the opposite, yeah. too. What's that? We the get opposite. the opposite. <laughs> right. Because your fault. Example. Yeah. Well, when yeah. someone dies, we that's the first thing we do is we're going to blame yeah. something. Wrong medication. Doctor, wrong this, hospice yeah. themselves. They didn't do this. They didn't do that. Yeah. God, you name it. Yeah. So yeah, it's not all peaches and cream. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the things I, I, I remember, you know, reading sort of a list of, of tips and things, and one of the things was to not use other words like uh, passing or up in heaven or that kind of thing, but instead using the word death or died and being very blunt about it. Right. I, it's it's weird. The the terms feel differently when I say them. You know, it feels much lighter to say passing. Oh, when my mom passed. It just feels better to say that. But this is sort of suggesting not to say that and to say, well, no, you know, she died. Well, yeah, and the, and the wisdom behind that somewhat is uh, from empirical research um, done years ago. And, you know, children pretty much are concrete thinkers up to like 13 years Mm -hmm. where they can start getting abstract ideas like passed away. So the more concrete you can, more black and white, it it cuts out any ambiguity or any. So when you're dealing with a child, you mean that's okay. Yeah. So I can still say the word pass away, just not when Absolute. I'm dealing with the children. Absolutely. Expired. <laughs> like the milk in the refrigerator. Right. Yeah, because we, you know, we want Got her to wings. Definitely. She got yeah. her wings. <laughs> but yeah. passed away, you know, kid doesn't be looking at you. And well, we like, kept saying up in heaven. And yeah. it was funny because, I mean, not funny, but my, my son would say like, hey, look, like there was like a balloon that went up in the sky. And he'd say like, look, the balloon, uh, grandma's going to get the balloon, <laughs> you know, because like conceptually she was up in the sky <laughs> and it was like a helium balloon, you know, floating up. And we just thought it was the cutest thing you know, at the time. Right. Um, well, you, then you can send messages. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. Imagine just tying <laughs> messages to balloons right. and sending them up. You know, what a great idea. <laughs> that's a good idea. You know, actually. what about this is this is weird, too, is, um, you know, the children seem to have like a sixth sense or something where they have this connection to the person that died. And I can give you an example from my own experience. You know, my son was, like I said, about three or or so. My daughter's one. We have a lot of pictures, um, you know, of my mom and them, you know, her holding them. She was there at the births and everything else. Even though she was really sick, she made it. They still talk about her all the time. You know, I mean, they, they comment about her. They, they, oh, grandma, this. And remember when this. And I mean, they, they'll talk about the pictures. I mean, and a lot of it unsolicited. You know, there, there has been a time where my son, I've seen him just starting to cry. I'm like, what's going on? He goes, oh, I miss grandma. Mm. I'm like, well, what just reminded you of that? <laughs> you know, or, or something like that. So it's kind of a, it's, it's weird that at that young of an age, and maybe because the spirit is so powerful in our house and how we talk and everything else, that somebody can feel like that, even though they don't really, 
know, they had very short amount of time with them. If, if you, I, I don't, I can't speak for your children, but I also know that children are, have a really high sense of empathy in mm-hmm. some degree. They feel your feelings. That's very true. So they're probably channeling that through you or through your mom. That's a great point. The mom and the dad. Yeah, yeah. Simultaneously. So they're like, there's a loss here. They know it's important they to us. They know it's important to you, yeah. No, that's true. Yeah. That makes I, sense. I that's think kids do it, yeah. And, and what about like, you know, you know, because one of the things that was difficult too is same thing about hiding your emotions and everything else is actually, you know, hiding them from the actual funeral. You know, because one of the things I think it says is like include them in that process. Right. You know, what do you think about that? My bias would be to include them. Uh, this gets into somewhat cultural and personal beliefs, obviously. And okay. but um, I don't think it. If you don't make it scary for them, and if if you can explain it to them in their level and in their words, um, you know it's not a scary place for them. And and funerals serve a purpose. We do funerals to give us ritual around this loss, mm-hmm. and ritual leads us to deeper meaning. Right. And it would do the same for a child. Now they're not going to have the same depth and insights that we do. Well. My son just I'm, thought we were going on a boat. Right. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not so sure sometimes. I've heard some pretty amazing things out of, you know, oh, yeah. five and six-year-olds. Yeah. But, yeah, to include them because what happens if you don't bring them and you're going to this funeral thing and they're not, again, they're not included. They don't know what's going on. These a lot to the imagination. This must be a really bad thing. Right. You know. Yeah. In fact, there's an interesting story. I hope I get it right. It was my... Um, we were on the boat and because my mom wanted ashes spread in the ocean. And so it was just a, just our immediate family and a couple people. And so we go out to sea and they were talking about a certain kind of whale. I don't know what, you know, whatever it is. And, the, and it, it, let's say it's a blue whale. I don't know. It's some big whale that you never see, you know? <laughs> and uh, we were talking about it and the guy, you know, the, the captain or whatever, he's like, no, 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 they don't migrate right now. You know, you're not going to see, you know, you're not going to see that. And I think it was my nephew who, who had said, he's like, well, I wanted to see a whale. You know, I, I, that was like, I really wanted to see it. So we're all sitting there quiet. And all of a sudden you see him like yell out, look, a whale. <laughs> and so I think my, it was my sister. One of my sisters said like, Hey, if grandma wants her t- grandchild to see a whale, there's going to be a whale. <laughs> and you know, the captain was like, I, I can't believe this. Yeah. Like, and it was just just weird. We were all yeah. we all just started laughing because it's like, no, no, Grandma wants him to see the whale, so she's going to make sure that there's a whale there. So <laughs> it was you know something along those lines, and it was right. just an amazing sort of thing at that. I mean, for that to happen, you know, something like that, yeah, yeah. we're just like, yeah, that's that's Grandma, you know, <laughs> right? Just making sure everybody else is happy, you know. <laughs> yeah, I look at it sometimes like uh, when you're talking about your children and how they're relating to your mother because mm-hmm. it's the relationship never dies right and right it's like it's like the loved one leaves a vapor mm. and the yeah. vapor is just always there and i it must be really great for you to see that and to see how your mother lives even in your children when they connect yeah. with her either in sadness or yeah it's it's a weird Situation. I mean, I got to be honest, it's it's a little strange that like, you know, well, like I said, we'll be having dinner and my son is sad or something. It's like, well, what do you say? Well, I'm grandma. I was thinking about grandma, you know, or so. I mean, it's like we, we weren't talking about grandma. We weren't. There was nothing here that reminds me of grandma. But some for whatever reason, he was thinking about it. Mm-hmm. You know, it had that much of an impact or and it still does. You know, so it's it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, are there any other sort of, you know, major tips that you see? I mean, we've talked about honesty. That's a big one. Um, you know, the words that we use and just being straight, you know, including right. them in the process. I mean, that's really important. Is there anything else that you sort of, you know, nuggets or things? I You know, I want to give people who might be dealing with this, you know, concrete suggestions of like right. here's what you need to do. I mean, you know, do you suggest contacting a hospice or contacting, you know, are there resources out there that people can go to? Yeah. Yeah, so anybody can call a local hospice and like I said, bereavement departments are going to be different different from hospice to hospice, so they may not have the amount of resources like I do where I have uh 
five other grief counselors at my disposal to help oh, wow. the community. Yeah. So not every hospice. And in yours, like you know, because I went to your group, but meanwhile we weren't serviced by your hospice. So that was great. I mean, that was just something right. you helped the community with. Right. It doesn't mean that that hospice had to. We had to go to your hospice in order to to for you to help. You Correct. Know, they're just more about serving the community. Well, that's one of the missions of our hospice when it was set up. 35 years ago wow yeah. and it was a back then hospices were all purely volunteer oh okay uh, not so much anymore you have for-profit hospices and not-for-profit hospices like mine but uh, we just have a mission that we've stood up with for 35 years to, to service the community at large not just our patients and their families so, I, I mean, this is a, gets a little bit more on the business side of it, but I'm curious. It says, so you make, you bill insurance and then, or like Medicare, and then do you also do fundraising and things like that? Or how do you, you know? Right. So we only can bill Medicare for medical services for the patient. Who's um, older, who has Medicare, right? Who has Medicare. If someone's uh, not of Medicare age, then most commercial insurances have the same benefit. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much the same. They pretty much go off of the Medicare guidelines and okay. so forth. So when someone comes on hospice, they get a full team. Uh, they have a, a nurse. They have a home health aide. They have a social worker, a chaplain. And if uh, usually the social worker things that a bereavement counselors, um, you know, should go in while the patient's alive, then they have us as well. Got it. So, but we can only bill f for the, the medical medicals. services, okay. which is everything I talked about except for bereavement. Hmm. So <laughs> Medicare states that hospices have to provide bereavement, but they can't charge for it, and they're not going to get paid for it. Got it. So... One of the ways that my hospice, my bereavement department can function with its size is through donations and okay. and grants. Got it. Well, I was going to say grants, too. I mean, the, the local, right. I mean, especially if you're a non-for-profit, you go through the grant system and do that. Right, yeah. right. If you're for-profit, you yes. charge for everything. And <laughs> right. And, uh, you know, we have a wonderful community here in North San Diego County, and they're very generous with us. And, um so, you know, not only do we do individual counseling in the groups, but we do three memorial events a year that's open to the community. Uh, we don't charge for them. We have one coming up, for instance, on December 10th, which is we call Light Up a Life, which is a ceremony where people get to light a candle and state their loved one's oh, name cool. in a microphone. And we have a little program and live music and so forth. So uh, it's, a, it's a great uh it's really a great event. We do it at Agua Hedianda Lagoon at the Nature Center there oh, off right. Cannon. Okay. So it's beautiful. We do it in the evening under a tent and lights. It's really So cool. I would imagine a lot of, you know, hospices, or you'd hope, I mean, they do those kinds of community outreach things. I mean, that's, right. that's where you make right. a lot of funds and a lot of, you know, um, sort of impacting the community. Right. So you can call your local hospice and, um, you know, see if they provide those services or not. And if they don't, they probably know one that does. And for us, for community clients, we do ask for a $20 per session um, donation. Okay. Obviously, if, if someone is unable to afford that, it's not anything. Which that's a lot cheaper than a typical right, therapist right. or something. Right. Yeah. And, we, you know, we do try to limit the sessions to, like, eight sessions. But, again, you know, it's individual case by case. So. Right. Yeah, the bottom line, I mean, I can talk from experience of that, you know, if you're dealing with death, talking to somebody is really important. You know, whether that is a counselor, it's, you know, some people find solace in family members and things. Um, you know, for me, it really was talking to the professional as well as the group and then being able to hear other people's stories. I mean, it's kind of like the dudes to dads meetup. You know, it's wow. There's other people going through this. The difference with grief is it seemed like, you know, well, it's the same as relationships and parenting <laughs> right. and stuff. Although you find a lot of similarities like, well, no, no, no. My situation's different. <laughs> you know, everyone sort of I mean, I, I recall there's, you know, I had my mother. There was another gentleman who had lost his wife. Another one had lost his brother. Another person had lost a pet. 
You know, I mean, and how can you be, you can't be critical of somebody else's loss. I recall being that way a little bit when I first got in there and be like, really? (laughs) Like, you know, and then, or even thinking the person who lost his brother of 80 years or whatever it was, like they were like a year apart, 80 and 81 or something. Wow, like that must be even harder. You know what I mean? And you're sitting there judging somebody else's grief, <laughs> and then you realize, like, I, I, that you can't do that. Yeah. Like, you just can't do that. Because, you know, first of all, I don't want them judging mine. Sure. Um, and realizing that everybody goes through that journey differently. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, but the most important thing was really talking about it, it was being honest, allowing you, you know, yourself to have those feelings. You know, and when it comes to your children, it's sort of the same rules. I mean, it's that's really what this, you know, the, this podcast, the, the point of it was, is to, you know, make sure that you are being honest. You know, you're including your kids in the process. Don't hide it. You know, be open about it. Um, you know, and if you're having some difficulty, you know, call call somebody. Yeah. You know, reach out. Like you said, a local hospice or something right. like that. That there are resources out there. You know, just because you're a guy and macho and you don't think you can cry or whatever. <laughs> right. You know, dads need to need to do that. I mean, it's a re- like you said, it's a really big benefit to the child. You know, you're really helping the child by doing that. Well, you know? the, the whole family. Yeah. The whole yeah. family. The whole family. Absolutely. Um, well, that's this is awesome. I, I'm really glad we had a chance to, to talk about this yeah. stuff. Is there any sort of last last points or anything you uh, feel like might be missing? Um, yeah, I wanted to um, I wanted to say that grief is a natural reaction to loss. So just take that in for a minute. So. Even if you feel like someone isn't grieving or they seem okay, they're going to be reacting somehow. It may be a contained nuclear reaction way down deep uh, with children. It's going to show up in behaviors. You right. know, If it's not being handled openly and honestly like we discussed, you're going to see irritability. You're going to see you know, aggressive behavior. You're going to see it. maybe... And you may not know what that is from. Right, right. Interesting. Yeah. And, you know, another thing with the children we didn't get into too much, but, you know, different ages require different right. discussions. But it's not that hard to do because you just let the child lead the discussion. And I have found, and maybe you dads out there have found the same thing, that when you're talking to your kid about something, they're asking you about something... Uh, they hear as much as they want to, and then they <laughs> they move on yeah, pretty yeah. easy. Right. Right? So the same thing. If you're talking to your four-year-old about death, you know, they're going to have so much information, and they're good to go. And then your eight-year-old comes up. It's going to be a bit of a different conversation. Right. And, you know, same with your teenager. Got it. Well, you're a grandparent now, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, congratulations. <laughs> I, think, I think you were just becoming a grandparent when we were, or you, maybe you were becoming a grandparent again. When we yes, were first yeah, yeah, I've got four. Nice. Mm, so. Nice. So, well, well, thank you very much, Jim. Uh, once again, it was uh, Jim Reiser, marriage and family therapist, um, bereavement services, services coordinator for the Hospice of the North Coast. I appreciate you coming in. Yeah, is there any information that we can give to the listeners that can get them in touch with you specifically? Right. You can reach me at our number at 760-431-4100. You can ask for bereavement or you can ask for me by name, Jim Reiser. Okay. And we'd be glad to help. That's awesome. Great. And once again, any feedback you guys have, uh, comments, questions, suggestions, once again, our email, podcast at dudestodads.com. Facebook, dudestodads.com. Twitter, (laughs) at dudestodads, all the different social networks. Yeah. Um, And with that, Jim, I just wanted to say thanks again. Like I said, you're really instrumental in helping me establish what we're doing now. I I, I feel like he was one of the stepping stones for this. Yeah. So uh, greatly appreciative. I'm really grateful to hear that. That's awesome. Glad you're doing well. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Well, with that, we will see you next time. Take care, everybody. Take care.